Welcome to Veterans Speak, War, Trauma, and the Humanities. I'm your host, Kevin Smith. Since the beginning of civilization, humans have used philosophy, literature, religion, art, music, history, and language to understand and record our world. These different forms of expression are referred to as the humanities. Knowledge of these records of human experience give us the opportunity to feel a sense of connection to those who have come before us. Today, there are approximately 20 million veterans in the United States. Since the end of the draft in 1973, the United States has maintained a fully volunteer professional military. As a result, a smaller percentage of people than ever before have been asked to deploy to foreign wars and have often been asked to do so repeatedly. With limited reporting in our nation's media about ongoing conflicts around the globe, the information gap between our military and our general public widens, making it increasingly difficult for our veterans to share the stories of their experiences. During this program, we'll take a look at how the engaging war-related humanities sources enables veterans to make connections with their own experiences and helps others better understand war's impact on those who serve. Joining us to talk about the ways that literature can serve as a means to better understand the experiences of combat veterans are Dr. Rosemary Johnson, professor of English literature at Governor State University, and whose father is a Vietnam War veteran. Also joining us is Mr. Robert Mason. Robert is a digital imaging graduate student and a Marine Corps veteran. Also, we have Mr. Victor Jesus Garcia, interdisciplinary studies undergraduate student and a Marine Corps veteran. We stated earlier that non-veterans are more and more removed from the experience of war, and that has led to a greater divide between veterans and civilians. So my first question is to you, Dr. Johnson. How did your National Endowment for the Humanities grant aim to address um, and give the five students credence with your class? Well, the NEH's Dialogue on the Experience of War program is relatively new. It's just a couple years old, and its aim is to open up conversations about these issues using the humanities as a way into them so that you begin the conversation by looking at humanities products. Um, so Andre Merrick and I proposed a special topics course, War Trauma and the Humanities, so a regular GSU course with regular GSU students in it. Um, but our proposal was to bring in the five student veterans to serve as discussion leaders and to help make connections between their experience and the literature that we were reading. Uh, we were thrilled to get the grant because it allowed us to move forward with the class, which has been a great success, I think, for everyone involved. But it also lets us take the conversation out of the classroom. Um, the grant drew some off-campus attention, and we get to have public events, including this town hall this evening. So another question, with the five student groups, can you explain um, what they do and how you prepare them for that experience in the class? First of all, we selected the five after a competitive process, so we went into it confident that they were well suited for the job. Uh, before the class began, we spent six weeks in meetings um, dealing with some of the content, so introducing course material, learning some historical context, learning about resources that are available. Uh, we also addressed the skills side, so how do you read a poem? Um, how do you redirect discussion when it gets off topic? Things like that, so that they had a chance to practice those things during the training sessions. And then at the end of the training, we did some planning with them for the the first course sessions that we would have. Um, in the course itself, their main role is leading discussion in small groups, which have been set up a little bit differently each week. And they also take a significant role in whole class discussion and all the class activities. Um, can you give us some examples of the range of literature uh, that you use for this course? And why did you select that? Nearly everything that we included in the course was written by a veteran or someone else who had frontline experience, but within that we looked for a broad range of genre and we cover more than 100 years of time from the beginning of the First World War up until right now. 
Um, we spent the first half of the course on First World War literature, primarily British literature, um, including two weeks of poetry, a novel, and a film about a uh, First World War Welsh poet. Um, there's many good reasons to spend that kind of time initially on the First World War. Uh, one is it made a natural way to begin our engagement with the humanities because there's a little bit of distance between us and it. It's also a period that produced a lot of great literature, particularly coming out of Great Britain. Um, because of the scale of the mobilization, poets went to war. Um, others took up poetry as a way to articulate their experience after they were in the war. Um, secondly, we have, over the last several years, hit a variety of centenaries, and these have been marked with commemorations, special museum exhibits, things like that. It's a good time to be looking at the First World War. Some of those things we were able to bring into class directly, and others we used the class hashtag on Twitter. Um, to link to images and supplemental readings and things like that. Uh, the First World War was a cataclysmic event. Um, it really shaped everything that's happened after. So you have technological advances. It was the first time tanks were used. Uh, mustard gas was created. Um, but at the same time, you had the troops kind of stagnating in these trenches. And so the First World War was the first time that what we now call PTSD became an issue that had to be addressed. So one of the things we got to do in the class was look a little bit at the kind of medical treatment that was available for what at that time was called shell shock. So the First World War really gave us a good base and then we moved from there. Good, thank you. I know we could talk about that the whole evening just on World War I, correct? Um, Mr. Mason, of all of the humanity resources you were exposed to during this program, uh, you related to one piece of poetry the most. There was an excerpt in particular from a World War I poem by E.A. McIntosh called, In Memoriam, Divided a Private D. Sutherland, Killed in Action, the German Trench, May 16, 1916, and the Others Who Died. Can you please share this with us? So you were David's father, and he was your only son and the new cut peats are rotting, and the work is left undone because of an old man weeping, just an old man in pain, for David, his son David, that will not come again. Happy and young and gallant, they saw their firstborn go, but not the strong limbs broken and the beautiful men brought low. The piteous writhing bodies, they screamed, don't leave me, sir, for they were only your fathers, but I was your officer. Robert. Why did you select this poem, and what does it mean to you? Well, life was about relationships, and the relationships we shared on the battlefield were very close, and very intense. Mm -hmm. This particular poem resonated with me because most of the troops or the, the young men I served would call me Daddy Mason instead of Sergeant Mason. So I saw it from that officer's perspective. I was very close with the guys I serve with. My favorite scripture is, there's no greater love than a man would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus said that to his disciples, but who knows that better than a soldier on the battlefield? How does this poem resonate with your own experiences? You can go into that a little bit more. I can remember coming out of a, uh, I was going into a tent. Another corporal was coming out. And he stopped me and he said, Corporal Mason, what's wrong? And I stepped back because I, I wasn't sure what he was talking about. But he said, you're not smiling. And I said, what do you mean? He said, if you're not smiling, we're in trouble. I need you to smile. I had to go have a moment with God after that conversation because I let something get to me. And it was reflecting. I had to change the way I thought in that moment. We were that close. Dr. Johnson, is this a poem that is typical of World War I poetry? The First World War poetry is obviously quite various. Um, but one thing in the selection that Robert chose that I think is, is fairly characteristic is that we see in that poem, the father of the dead soldier is kind of a stand-in, I think, for a wider audience at home. 
that doesn't know what it's like and on some level can't know what it's like, but the poem is an attempt to convey very vividly the sights, the sounds, the smells of it, and the lasting emotional impact that it has on those who are there. And um, a, lot, a lot of the poems do that. Some are angry at the people at home and others are not, but I think that, that's a very um, characteristic move of the, of the poems. Victor, after uh, hearing Robert read that piece of literature, does that also resonate with you? Yeah, um, right away it comes to an experience of seeing an officer, um, how he experienced the death of a Marine um, that was a subordinate, one, one, one of the squad leaders. And you could see how he still operated and still would conduct himself as an officer would in, in theater. But when he was separated from the field in the birthing area where we were away sometime, you could see where he was suffering. You know, he wasn't eating, he was kind of distanced from himself. And it was kind of the idea of the burden of command and you saw it in the officers that a lot of times they kind of put this persona that they had to carry on and then the list they weren't allowed to see that. Mm -hmm. But I did see it. And also with that, um, with the same Marine, also it made me think about his mother, you know, back home. I found out sometime later that she had found out that he had died on Easter Sunday. So I couldn't imagine what that would have, I can't even imagine what that would have felt like. I, I understand how I felt and how I could see it in the officer, but very different for the mother at home. Victor, you chose a different piece of literature that focuses on the war in Vietnam. Timothy O'Brien's short story and book, The Things They Carried. You have mentioned in class on a number of occasions that this particular selection reminds you of your own actions in Fallujah. Can you please share this selection for us? They carried all the emotional baggage of men who might die, grief, terror, love, longing. These were intangibles, but the intangibles had their own mass and specific gravity. They had tangible weight they carried shameful memories. They carried the common secret of cowardice. Men killed and died because they were embarrassed not to. Thank you, Victor. Can you also explain why this speaks to you personally? It was actually a, a point in the class. We were going over the things they carried um, by O'Brien. She's, uh, one of our, uh, my peers related to is like, do men, like, do, do guys fight because they're embarrassed not to? And it brought me back to a real world moment. And this is, this is even before Fallujah. This was actually for the invasion of Iraq. Um, we were ambushed in al -Kut, And then I re part of the ambush, there was this building that needed to be cleared. There was a grenade thrown in. The grenade tossed up all the dust and everything that was in there. And I remember I was the first one to go into that room. And I, when I went into the, into the, the building, the, there's a little shack, it was filled with smoke. And I remember just for that moment, because you had time to think, well, the dust cleared up. Like, oh, shoot. Like, this is different. This is close in your face. I might have to engage someone. And for a moment there, I was like, why am I just standing here? Because I'm not going to lose face with my fellow Marines. I want to stand my ground because that's what they expect me to do. And because, frankly, I was, I, I was more fearful of showing fear to my fellow Marines than of fear of death at that moment. So in that respect, it resonated with me. And that, it changed over time with Fallujah itself. Um, I learned that we fought for different reasons. Uh, we carry different things, the loss of people. There's... And it's hard to explain that. And as O'Brien writes, it's the intangible. How do you explain how much that weighs on us when we lose someone? And we saw that more so in my second deployment in Fallujah. Robert, what sort of impact does hearing Victor read that piece of literature have on you? Uh, the things we carried is, is special to me also because I think we've all had a love affair with an M16. But <laughs> We've all carried, you know, weapons that, that we didn't get to bring home. Um, but there are other things that we carried 
intangible things, like you said, that um, that take place on the battlefield, you have to amp up and be ready for whatever because you don't know what's next. All you know is you have a mission and you have to move. You don't get to necessarily take that off and leave it there. More often than not, veterans bring that home. And those are things that we still carry today. And I think um, the number of veteran suicides is you know, proof of that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Johnson, as a professor of literature, do you see any similarities between these two pieces chosen by both Robert and Victor? Yeah, I do. Um, they, they both are using what literature offers to really drill down into difficult experience. And so Tim O'Brien in the, the passage that Victor read is talking about the weight of intangibles, which is a very literary idea, I think. Um, elsewhere in the story, he is at pains to offer very precisely weights of tangible things that the characters in the story um, have to tote around with them. It's an emotional experience, which is expressed through this kind of vivid detail, which is very literary, and it also calls for an emotional response from the reader. Um, and it, it also, I think, suggests a kind of second audience. I had talked about the audience that needs to be told, the ones who aren't there, but I think both of these pieces also, there's an audience for people who get it, for veterans who can feel the authenticity of it. And we, we hear that in, in what Robert and Victor say about the literature. Yeah. Um, Dr. Johnson, Robert, Victor, uh, any final thoughts about the ways in which this class and literature helps us to better understand, you know, the experiences of combat veterans and the trauma that's often suffered? So I'd like to add to what Dr. Johnson already said. It does, these pieces that we covered in this class alone, which there's more, transcends time. And not only is this something, a tool that we can use to speak to non-veterans to uh, impart our experiences and try to um, explain through the poetry, um, film, or, or whatever have you, but it's also a tool for veterans ourselves, uh, veterans of this of most recent conflicts, mm -hmm. because we can look back to the veterans who have gone through this already and learn from them how they were able to express themselves. And instead of trying to reinvent the wheel in a, in a, in a sense, um, using them to guide us in how we can best express ourselves. And I, I know Robert does film, you know, he, he does veteran pieces of film as well. Other veterans are coming back, now they have a way by looking back in time and reading other pieces. Yeah, I never, um, I never expected to connect with the kind of literature that we saw, especially in World War I, mm -hmm. until I started reading. Right. And, um, nearly everything in the book that we read was something that I could relate to. You know, there's, there's a language and there's a, you know, there, there are things that we, we just share. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter if it's World War I, World War II, Vietnam War. And because of what I've, I've had the opportunity to be exposed to, I've been able to have even better conversations with other veterans throughout the program, you know strangers. We just come in contact with one another and continue yeah. to talk. Well, I'd like to thank all three of you for joining us today and sharing all the experiences. We'll be right back after this short break to discuss other types of war-related humanities sources and how other student veterans relate to them. Veterans Speak will return in a brief moment. This program is brought to you by Governor State University's Digital Learning and Media Design Department and was funded by a National Endowment for the Humanities grant, Dialogues on the Experience of War. This grant program was launched in 2015 in order to support the study and discussion of important humanities sources about war in the belief that these sources can help U.S. military veterans and others think more deeply about the issues raised by war and military service. For more information about the War, Trauma, and Humanities Project, visit www.govst.edu forward slash CAS grants.
Welcome back to Veterans Speak, War, Trauma, and the Humanities. I'm your host, Kevin Smith. The first part of the program looked at how engaged war-related literature and poems enables veterans make connections with their own experiences and help others better understand war's impact on those who serve. Now we'll shift to examining some other types of humanity sources. Joining us to talk about other forms of humanities and how they provide means of communication and understanding their experiences of combat veterans are Dr. Andre Merrick, Professor of History and Political Science and Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at Governor State University. Dr. Merrick uh, is a veteran of the Army Reserve and uh, is a, uh, I'm sorry, Wisconsin and the New York Army National Guard. Got all that out, there we go. Uh, we also have Ms. Akaya Gossett, social work undergraduate student and an Army veteran. We have Ms. Muriel V. Williams, business and applied science and Army Reserve veteran. And also we have Mr. Jermaine Drayton, interdisciplinary studies undergraduate student and Army veteran. Welcome to the program. Dr. Merrick, um, we spoke earlier about the number of veterans in the U.S. and how the number of active members of the military have continued to decline since the end of the draft. Uh, with the smaller and smaller population that can truly emphasize the veteran experience, how can the humanities help us to bridge uh, the gap between veterans and civilians? Yeah, so this is one of the major uh, focuses that uh, uh, Dr. Johnson and I had in writing this grant is it strikes us that uh, um, that there's fewer that that's people who serve in the military come from a smaller subset of places in our society mm -hmm. um, and those folks are often quite disconnected from the rest of us especially given the way that we can now choose our, our media uh, our news and our sources for information right and so there's less and less discussion across party lines there's less and less discussion across uh, political ideologies and those things. And the humanities have served uh, in our class uh, as a space in which people of wide range of different persuasions could get together and we'd, we had a rule in class, right? Uh, which is that we always start with the text. We always start as that for the basis. We don't start with our opinions. We start with the actual materials in front of us, be it a film, uh, oral histories, uh, you know, uh, records, letters, uh, whatever they might be. And so there's a common space or a common place that we start from before we begin to break that down and, and share our lived experiences through those. Can you give me some examples of the different types of humanities other than poetry and fiction that you and your student veterans use for this project, and why did you select those? Yeah, so, so well, I'm a historian, right? So some of it is that. So we used um, oral histories. Um, this is a, um, uh, we had Mr. Patrick Russell came to do uh, uh, oral histories, and, and he argued that even using transcripts of oral histories that were done in the past doesn't capture the sorts of ways in which uh, we can understand people and their experiences visually, right? And I think uh, everyone here would agree that there's some really painful moments that uh, uh, of seeing people explain their circumstances that you can only catch because you watch how their body works or, or how people seize up and those sorts of things on, on camera. We also did personal correspondence. You're gonna see here that uh, all of these students here uh, select personal correspondence as, a, as their, their, um, uh, their type of humanities. I, I think we were really surprised that that was the case, but perhaps as a historian we shouldn't be. This is one of the ways in which we, we dig back into the past and understand it is the letters that people send to other people that are really heartfelt and close to home. I know you brought in uh, Mr. Patrick Russell. I had the honor of not only meeting him, but also you brought somebody else in and why did you, and who was this individual again? Maybe explain. Yeah, yeah. So Rick Ryan wrote mm -hmm. a um, a fictional memoir of uh, Vietnam, and uh, we brought him in because he wanted to talk about. So he served during the Vietnam era, but he actually worked to avoid serving in Vietnam, and he argues, and I think a lot of people would. Uh, uh, he was convincing in this, is that he also carries uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, things too. Um, from his service in his, from his service of avoiding Vietnam, he went to Germany and served uh, in the MPs there, um, and uh, um, and he left a different person as a result of his service during that time period. Akaya, uh, you related to one of these nonfiction sources, a letter from Staff Sergeant Sharon McBride, 
wrote to her unborn daughter called Dear Baby. Can you please share that with us? Sure. Dear Baby, as you grow inside me, I have been thinking more and more of what it means to be a mommy in the U.S. Army. Let me be the first to tell you, though, that we have a rough road ahead of us, kiddo. The life of a soldier isn't an easy one. As a soldier, I have given my word that if the call comes for me to do my part in making the world a better place to live, I'll go. No hesitation, no questions asked. I'm gonna miss a lot of important things, perhaps many of your first birthdays, holidays, you know, all the good stuff. But I am a soldier. It's a profession that few choose, but one that many don't hesitate to call when there's trouble to be fixed. While we are together though, I promise to hold you a little bit longer than necessary, fix your favorite food for dinner, kiss you a lot, hold your hand, and take as many photos of you as possible. Memories of these will help to sustain us while we are apart. Just take to heart that being an army baby won't be bad at all. There will be sweets to go with the sour. You'll get to travel and see other cultures that other kids won't get to see. There will always be food on the table and clothes on your back. And if you get sick, you will always have medicine to make you feel better. So you were a mom twice. Can you please tell us a bit about the emotional toll that deployment has had on you and your family? I think it's interesting to realize that I went into the military already as a mom, right? And before I even had my first son, dialogue was already taking place that I was gonna join. Then I found out I was pregnant and that kind of postponed things. And so after being in and being a single mom and now having another kid and knowing that this is what comes with the territory of choosing this type of profession, it takes an emotional toll on you. And I think that it takes an emotional toll on your family as well, because how do you explain that you chose this and that you're intentionally choosing to be a mom again, knowing that neglect indirectly or directly may be something that you may have to do or that's an emotion that your child may experience. How do you, how do you explain that to someone who has been allowed to be with their children 24 seven? It, it's kind of hard to explain that and it's kind of hard to explain to your children when they get older and they ask why. Like why you didn't want to stay with me. Right. Mariel, can you relate to this also? Definitely. Um, when I deployed, I was an unmarried mother um, of an eight and a half month year old son. And I, you know, just leaving him, you know, it was a sense of duty, definitely. Um, but of course, you don't want to leave your child. Um, so going away, um, I made sure I tucked his, um, his picture in my Kevlar. And whenever I had the moment, you know, to look at it, um, I would always say, you know, God, please help me get back to my son. Um, but definitely, like Akaya was saying, you know, um, you feel like there's a point of neglect there. You know, you're, you're mother and you're leaving your, your infant, your newborn, um, your, your little one back home. Um, even though you're going to fulfill an obligation, um, you do feel as a, a parent, there's a sense of, you know, I'm, I'm neglecting my child. Um, so I can definitely uh, relate. You know, Mario, you, uh, you've also selected uh, correspondence from the collection Operation Homecoming. You selected an excerpt written by a mother about her son returning from deployment. Can you please share this with us? This week he's due home, this son of mine. I wonder, is he nervous? Is he excited? This child who was so kind and sensitive, so caring of his mother, I can't even imagine what war has done to him. Is he expecting everything to be just the same as when he left? I remember some veterans saying they wanted everything to be exactly the same when they came home. And when it wasn't, it was a nasty shock. This week is full of questions, full of doubts, full of excitement. I walk around with a smile on my face, despite my concerns. I get to see him and hug him to count his fingers and toes, to sit near and just watch him sleep and remember all the times I did the same thing when he was two and 10 and 15, to pretend just for a while that he is not a grown up soldier in a war. He is just my son here back in my home. 
Can you please explain why you selected this expert and how does it connect with you? I s selected this particular piece because it touches me in two ways. Um, the first way is upon leaving, you know, you're leaving, you know, my son, but I also left my mother. At the time I wasn't married, so I left my mother, I left my sister. Um, and this is coming from a mother regarding her son, her child, um, you know, coming home from war and what has war done to, you know, her child. Um, I had never asked my mother, you know, how did this, how did this play into her emotions and how, you know, what was her day like, you know, wondering if her, her daughter was okay. So that was the first um, way that it, it, it touched me. And the second way was, you know, I was the mother, you know, being a world away, I would call it, um, for my son. Um, I did miss the, the first steps and I missed the first words, um, the first birthday. I missed those first milestones. And just wanting to, to, to make sure that, you know, um, in his mind, you know, that he would still know me. And then that was the nasty shock I, I came home to. Um, he didn't know me, you know, reaching out to my own son, you know, he, you know, pulled back, you know, as if I was a stranger. And so that was um, a great shock to me, you know, coming home, you know, from an obligation, of course, um, but my own son not knowing who I was. So that was, that was the other part that really, really connected with me. Jermaine, you also selected a personal correspondence from Operation Homecoming. That's right. Um, you selected a story about a U.S. Marine who volunteers to return a soldier's remains back to his hometown. You said that Operation Homecoming resonated with you just because of yourself as a deployed soldier were irrevocably changed by your deployment. Can you tell us a bit about the Chance Phillips and Lieutenant Colonel Michael R. Strobel's choice to take Chance home, and why did you select that? I chose this story, although it's a Marine story, and I'm Army. I, ch I chose the story because of the officer. He volunteered, basically, for this duty. And this, this type of duty, you don't hear about every day. You won't see this televised. You won't see this on CNN. Uh, the officer, he was an uh, unsung hero uh, in this event. Uh, he realized that Chance was from the same hometown that he was from. And usually in events like this, when the fallen, uh, they're usually escorted by enlisted or whatever the rank is of the fallen. Uh, that's how, that's who brings you home. Well, for an officer to bring home an enlisted soldier, it speaks volumes about that officer. Right. So um, this story, um, it was very near and dear to me because um, this officer, he found out everything he could about PFC Chance, everything. Um, he was very meticulous in his, his belongings that was on his body. Um, he stayed with Chance the whole way as he was transported throughout the United States. When he got to Chance's hometown and he uh, was greeted by the family, he wanted everybody to know uh, the person Chance was from, from his experience with Chance. You know, he told his family uh, uh, stories about um, how he was with him the whole way. Like this was his son or this was his brother, which it was. You know, although we came from different sides, uh, officers enlisted because you know, uh, there's a, a certain divide with officer enlisted, and that's probably in, in each branch, you know. But for, for uh, the officer to do this, this deed, it spoke volumes. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Merrick, as a historian, political scientist, and a veteran, how should these stories fit into our broader understanding of war and its impact on members of the military and their families. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So, so I think, uh, again, uh, I think it's worth pointing out that all three of these students, in spite of the fact that we did oral histories, personal correspondence, um, film, uh, literature, poetry, um, that they selected personal correspondence, right? So that, um, that there's, there's something unique about the ways in which the writing of letters and uh, um, telling of, of stories to other people that we care about and we love is uh, um, is different, right? Um, I think we expected when we went into this that 
I expected that it was going to be the literature and the poetry that would speak most closely to our student veterans. And, and it does, right? I mean, it, uh, there's a full range of these things that do, but the fact that the personal correspondence is there, I mean, uh, at one level, it makes me think like, hey, we need to get off, of, uh, um, get off of texting all the time and spend some time to write people that we care about and those sorts of things, right? Um, I think there's something else here too, right? Is the assumption that war is about men, right? And so we spent quite a bit of time talking about the different experiences that women have. So why is it that two women who are on our panel and served overseas and served uh, in war zones are, are more connected with the, the absence of their children than the men who left children behind as well, right? And that is part of the expectations for women when they go away to war, but also when they come home, right? So women have different sorts of uh, combat veterans, women who are combat veterans, have different sorts of experiences of dealing with their experiences when they come back than men do because there's different expectations for them. Um, so I, I think that uh, these, this correspondence and these stories um, tell us something about the really different ways and the really uh, that people experience this, but also the really different needs that different individuals have when they come back home about who, what sort of support they might need and what sort of help they can get. Um. Can you address how we might better create, um, I guess maybe better spaces, opportunities for the, ne uh, for the necessary and really difficult discussions moving forward? Yeah, so, so I mean, right here today, we have almost everybody in the audience are students from our class uh, who were there for the entire semester. A good uh, subset of them are veterans, but most of them weren't, right? Um, and I'm here talking now, but really this is a question we should ask these veterans, is that um, they were the focal point of our class, and uh, uh, Dr. Johnson and I spent quite a bit of time working with them to get them set, and then we cut them loose, right? Um, so we, we just told them, like, you will arrive prepared, right? And and they did. They were there. They were prepared. They helped us run the class in ways that the vast majority of class time was them working with other students. Um, and so, so maybe we can ask them these very same sorts of things is about their own experiences, leading discussions with other people. I mean, I used to go around to different groups and just sit down um, yeah. and learn, right, as opposed to step in and, yeah. and try to make things happen. You know, you had me as a guest uh, uh, one evening in your class, and I, I got to witness that. Um, Maybe you know one or two of you like to jump in real quick and just say, how did that affect you, your role? I mean, you were discussion leaders and you were facilitating with that class. What, what did that mean to you and how did you think that affected the other students in the class? Oh, Well, Kevin, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, now, uh, at one point in my career, I was a, a small group leader. So this was like second nature mm -hmm. to me to uh, take in information, uh, uh, throw it back out, receive uh, the information back and, and just let whatever happens happen, you know. So we would, we would uh, gather, the, gather around each other, small groups, it was, it was perfect. Um, we would uh, discuss dialogue about what we went over um, from the week prior or, or the current day. And we would, we would sit back and we were pretty much, uh, we would learn um, from some of our, our actual other brothers in class, because we had other veterans in class that uh, gave out information as well too. They were senior to us, and we took in their information just like they took in our information, and everybody learned from each other. And then we would all uh, come together towards the end of the evening, and we would all uh, uh, share our experiences. And it was a great thing. Uh, questions would, would be asked, and they would be answered. Um, the, the class was great. They were great. Yeah. yeah, I think to facilitate was a big thing. Um, going into it, I was extremely nervous because there's <laughs> such this huge stigma about interactions with veterans versus non-veterans and what that really looks like. So to be, to facilitate a group and then actually want to know about my experience but also relating that to the literature or the oral correspondence or whatever it was that we were reading, to have them kind of combine the two, it was, it was really awesome. It was amazing. I was, I was definitely taken aback by the serious interest. Um, I liked how the course was set up as an elective. So no one was here, you know, by required, you know, graduation requirements. Um, they were here because they wanted to be in this class. Um, and just hearing the different um, reasons for taking this course, it, it just really kind of um, 
made me feel a little bit better. Um, you know, definitely like Akaya said, you know, from a veteran, you know, discussing your experience to a non-veteran, um, you're not always comfortable because you don't think that they can always connect. And so, uh, but definitely, you know, connecting with, um, you know, some of the veterans that were in the class and then also some of the non-veterans who may have had, you know, veteran, um, you know, spouses or family members. Um, it was definitely refreshing to get their point of view and also I felt more comfortable being able to, you know, download um, some information from my experience. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Dr. Merrick, Akaya, uh, Mariel, Jermaine, do you I mean, thank you so much for sharing with all of this. Do you have any final thoughts at all uh, in the ways in which the class or the literature helps us to better understand our experiences with combat veterans or the trauma <coughs> that, that is, is being suffered? I, I think that it allows for uh, information to kind of be shared amongst all veterans. World War II veterans, Vietnam veterans, OIF veterans, OEF veterans. And I think that in reading the literature, that was something that we really did not know. We didn't know how close our experiences were with people who had went to war years before, generations before our time. So to actually read that and see that I mean, it's bad, right, in a way, because then you think about what progress have we really made. But then you look at it and you say, wow, this guy that has served Vietnam, did World War II, like, I have the same experiences as him. Yeah. And that's something I think that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Yeah, Kevin, so maybe, maybe a final thought is that, um, that this course also, un, like, kind of unfolded over time. So, so it took a while to build trust with each other, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, where we were on week five compared to week one was really quite different. And the sorts of experiences people were willing to share uh, towards the end of the course were really quite different than the ones at the beginning. And people's ability to connect with other people sharing those things also changed, right, over time. So, um, so it's good that, that we had six weeks with the, uh, with the, uh, with the veterans to try, try to build rapport and uh, work together and build uh, bonds of trust. And then we restarted and had eight more weeks and then we had to rebuild new sets of trust with the students who entered the classroom, but the students did an awesome job. Yeah. I think that's important too, is that you did not bring the veterans into the class from the first week. You brought them in <coughs> halfway through, correct? No, no, they no, they were here six weeks, six weeks prior as we six trained with them, right. and then they helped us actually design. Um, they helped us actually design some of the course and what materials we were going to use uh, in the classroom itself. So we gave, we handed over some of the course authority for that uh, to the student veterans uh, because uh, we showed them here's a wide range of different approaches we could take. What are you most comfortable with? And then we adjusted over time, uh, knowing what they liked, what they wanted to work with, and how class flowed best. Well, again, I want to thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's just very enlightening, and uh, thank you for sharing your stories and your literature. We'll be right back after the short break with our student panel to continue with the compelling, these compelling conversations. Veterans Speak will return in a brief moment. This program is brought to you by Governor State University's Digital Learning and Media Design Department and was funded by a National Endowment for the Humanities grant, Dialogues on the Experience of War. This grant program was launched in 2015 in order to support the study and discussion of important humanities sources about war in the belief that these sources can help U.S. military veterans and others think more deeply about the issues raised by war and military service. For more information about the War, Trauma, and Humanities Project, visit www.govst.edu forward slash CAS grants. Hey, how are you? They say, and I'd answer, I feel like I'm being eaten from the inside out. And I can't tell anyone what's going on because everyone's so grateful to me all the time and I feel like I'm ungrateful or something. Or like, 
I'll give away that I don't deserve anyone's gratitude and really they should all hate me for what I've done, but everyone loves me for it and it's driving me crazy, right? That was an excerpt from Kevin Powers' award-winning The Yellow Birds about the internal conflict that some soldiers feel upon returning and it reflects exactly what we would like to talk about now. So my guests here, now that you have understand, now that you understand that you're not alone in your feelings about your service, do you think that you'll be able to better communicate with your husbands, your wives, <coughs> your partners, your kids, your neighbors? What do you think? I can go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we said this a lot throughout the course, Kevin. We, we said this was actually free therapy for us. Uh, now, for veterans, we can speak all day. You, you probably know that, Kevin. When I first met you, we, we hit it right off. But as we started to uh, open up dialogue about what happened to soldiers that was prior to prior generations to us, we were like, whoa. And we saw that they had girlfriends and they had wives and how the wives got along, you know, and how they, they reacted during uh, wartime, how the women all came together and they worked and they took care of the kids and they took care of their families and they took care of uh, seniors and, and all that. So after, after seeing that and after we, we discussed this with, with the class, we're like, whoa, now we can do the same things. We, we don't have to be in this closed box anymore, mm -hmm. you know. Um, like everybody uh, is familiar with the T walls and Jersey barriers and, and Texas barriers. And for whatever reason, right, you feel safe behind these walls, right? We took that back with us, hmm. you know? So, so uh, now we're not behind the walls. We can talk. And we know that there's somebody that will listen to us now. Anybody else? Yeah, I think like, like Jermaine said, I think that this allowed us to see a different side that we didn't set, we didn't see before. Mm -hmm. um, like Muriel said, reading some of the literature and reading some of the poems, it was like, wow, is this how my family felt when I left? Is is this what my friends felt? You know, when I didn't call, were they extremely worried? Um, you know, is is this how my children felt when I didn't Skype? Or so I think it, it gave us a different perspective that we never considered before because. From a veteran's perspective, we already have so much weight going on our shoulders that we never really consider the other sides to the circle. It's kind of like all we see is our side. So to actually engage in conversation with each other and with non-veterans and for them to even ask like, so, you know, how did your mom feel when you left for, you know, what did they say? It was like, wow, you, I, I don't. I don't know, because I never asked. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah, it, it, it brought out a lot that we never considered before. Yeah. Robert, uh, to expand on that, do you think this gave everybody a chance to kind of maybe do a self-reflection a little bit, maybe from previous, or maybe they've, this first time they've ever had some self-reflecting time about their service? I think we've all had an opportunity to self-reflect. I don't think... Um, you know, within the class, the literature that we've had an opportunity to, to, to share and discuss, I've had more conversations during this eight-week period than I've had in maybe 10 years wow. about my experience. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it just keeps coming out. And I've been, you know, <laughs> grabbing other people and bringing them along and challenging them to talk about what they experienced. Mm -hmm. You know, tell your story, um, you know, as a student, as a filmmaker, that's something that I really want to spend a lot of time with because we need to communicate. Yes. You know, my wife watches more, more war movies than I do. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it's because of her love for me and her desire to be able to connect. Right. You know, so having a way to help better communicate mm -hmm. the things that we feel the things that we don't discuss or talk, what we hadn't talked about. It, it, this class has helped bring that out more. Do, do, go ahead. I was going to add to that. that. One thing that also reflecting what Robert is saying and, and to your question is one of the, and during the oral history, someone mentioned like, oh, time heals. And not, that's not necessarily true. 
-hmm. you realize time to really doesn't heal. Right. It's just how you cope with it, how you manage it. It's different points in our lives. You know, we become fathers, mothers, we, be, you know, and then maybe hopefully grandparents and other things that, and then, so as we trans move through time, do our own time, meaning our growing up and maturing and mm -hmm. we learn how to cope through these things. And we just learned a new way of dealing with this and how we were ex able to express ourselves mm -hmm. to the students. And maybe we'll learn, I'll learn some more and maybe there'll be other things I think about 10 years from now. Right. When my daughter's old enough where I'm actually gonna explain this to her. Mm -hmm. I've explained this to my wife, but now uh, the new, the new thing that I have to do as a parent, as a father, is like, now how do I explain this to my daughter? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do any of you think that this program has helped to be more open uh, to sharing your own experience with non-veterans? Definitely. Um, as I stated before, as a veteran, you are not always comfortable to share your experience with a non-veteran because you don't think that they're they'll connect with you or that they'll understand um, how you felt, you know, in your, your wartime experience. Um, but this class has really made me more comfortable. Um, like I said, the, the seriousness of um, the students that were in this class, that just really relaxed me and, and allowed me to just, you know, share um, some of the things that um, I experienced. But I, I think it'll, it'll make me a whole lot more confident to you know, even discuss things outside of the school setting uh, with other non-veterans. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, I think that in speaking with non-veterans, it helped me to be able to identify how much I sometimes generalize non-veterans' uh, expectations or their, their, uh, their feelings towards veterans, mm -hmm. just like how um, sometimes we assume that they feel about us. And so I remember being a veteran and um, being in a classroom and we were talking about trauma one time and I remember the teacher called on me and was like, oh, you know, well, okay, why don't you tell us about your, 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 your trauma from being a veteran? And so the students in class were like, oh, she's about to blow. And, <laughs> and so it, it made me, moving forward, I always felt that that was like the general view of how non-veterans thought that veterans were. The labels, we're very aggressive, and oh, we have these long drawn out stories, and oh, we're gonna start crying, and the tears are gonna start flowing. But being in this space allowed me to kind of see that that's not what all non-veterans think about veterans, mm -hmm. just like veterans don't think that all non-veterans don't care. It's just the ones that we've experienced and the ones that we've experienced now just gave me a whole different light about how to engage with non-veterans and maybe what the conversation should maybe start off <laughs> at versus what it should end at. Yeah. Um, and anyone can take this question. How was the experience of leading GSU students in your classroom in discussion of war-related literature and humanities? Wow, it was, it was, it was great. It was great. Um, I, when you mentioned that, I, I mean, I wish, I wish one of our students was here right now. He, he loves to talk just as much as I do. <laughs> and he, he was an additive uh, to our class. He was, he's actually part of our success. And he's in the audience right now. Uh, he know who he is. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was great listening, uh, from, listening to him and, and getting information from him. Um, and the knowledge that he, he has, uh, he, he reminds me of the mentors uh, that I, I had when I was in, in the Army still. Um, for whatever reason, I used to hang out with Sergeant Majors, and these guys had all of the information you needed mm -hmm. to succeed. And they can talk to anybody, Kev, I mean anybody. And, and I soaked all that up, and I, I kept it with me, you know, so I never had a problem with with uh, discussing or, or trying to teach something to somebody or, or this is what I have, sharing. I never had a problem with that, and I never will. And when I met this, this one uh, student, I was like, wow, you do remind me of a sergeant major that, that I had, you know, yeah. and I'm glad that he was in our class. So, just adding to the stories, right? Because you said earlier, veterans can talk about anything, yeah. but then we get lost in our own terminology, our own jargon, yeah. and people are like, 
And that's part of the standoff issue mm -hmm. because we get in our own vernacular of what we're talking about. And right. you, I could talk to anyone and we'll just get going and, mm -hmm. and someone who's not a veteran will understand. And that's why the beauty of what Dr. Romerick said was going back to the literature mm -hmm. because the literature truly was there and really explain things, the way the poetry just flowed and how they describe, hear a bullet, you know, described every little thing about the bullet. Yeah. Mm. And so bringing it back to the literature and then the students would ask, well, was it really like that or was it this? So then we add extra authenticity to the literature because we'd be like, yes. Even though we were talking about something from World War I, yeah. we'll be yes because of this, because of our own mm. antidote of something that we experienced. So it was wonderful to be part of that. Yeah. And I, I can speak from experience in my office, the Veterans Resource Center, whenever a new veteran student or an existing veteran student walks in, I don't have to say a word. I just, I'll walk in and they'll be talking for, I'll have to go and sometimes say, you'd have class today, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to find them, right? So, yeah. So I do understand that. And I see yeah. that every single day, which is wonderful to see. But yeah, I can see how this, the literature and the humanity, how this actually broadens that. Um, how, uh, how did the students respond specifically uh, in the context as you as a veteran? I know I saw it when I was in class at one time, but I want to hear it from you. I think um, their response was they were very intrigued. Um, they were very, um, you know, really inter genuinely interested in wanting to hear our story. I received a question from one of the students and she said, you know, uh, you know, as we're talking about, you know, the, the non-dialogue of, you know, veterans to non-veterans, um, she said, what's this, the code of silence? You know, she said, why don't you all talk about your experience? And so I was able to share with her one-on-one -on -one about, you know, you know, not feeling able to connect, but um, very well received, um, you know, at one point, you know, it was almost as if, you know, I felt like, okay, you know, I'm just, you know, a, a student here. Um, but we do understand that, you know, we were the focal point for the, the course. Um, but you, you look at yourself as, you know, just someone fulfilling the job. Right. Yeah, and I think, like, we're, we're all soldiers. So, I mean, we're not sensitive at all. And so it was very surprising that in asking questions, they were very like sen they they wanted to make sure that they weren't offensive to us and it was like oh you can ask me whatever i'm not it's not gonna hurt my feelings but to see that they actually cared about like not being offensive to us versus somebody walking up to you and be like oh have you ever killed anybody you know some people do that and then yeah. for them to actually you know say hey i don't mean to offend you but you know what was it really like that so for them to be that empathetic towards us was absolutely amazing that I, th I thought that was that said a lot to me about them choosing this class and about them actually wanting to really get to know us on a different level yeah. than just a veteran well i want to thank victor mario robert Nakaya, jermaine dr johnson and dr merrick um it's just been a great great evening Great conversation. Thank you for participating in this conversation. Thank you to all. Um, we have barely scratched the surface here, but we here at uh, Governor State University will continue to explore uh, this discussion more in depth. For more information about war, trauma, and the Humanities Project, you can visit the website at www.govst at edu forward slash CAS grants. I'm Kevin Smith, and on behalf of Governor State University, thank you for joining us, and good night.